Logistics. Good morning. Everybody ready to be paneled? <laughs> uh, anybody wander into the room and have no idea who I am? Please be honest. It's okay. Awesome. Awesome. Thank you're, you. You're moderator. <laughs> you had no idea who I was? Yay. I love honesty. What's your name? Uh, Jose. Jose. Everybody give it up for Jose, please. Woo! Thank you. Okay, for the two of you who were honest enough, um, my name is Steve Bloom. I'm a voice actor from Los Angeles. I've uh, been at this for about 25 years or so and started an anime. I'll probably die in anime, uh, literally, in a room, you know, padded room filled with other people's DNA. Uh, <laughs> but what? Wow, I mean, like, you know, yeah. Uh, God, you guys are dirty minds. Wow, amazing. Um, and I've branched off into original animation, and uh, the most recent stuff I've been working on is Star Wars Rebels, so I'm flying the flag today. Any Star Wars fans out there today? Yeah. Woo! Yes! Yes, and uh, lots and lots of video games, and this is my first time in Miami, so thank you guys for having me here. Uh, and I'm going to bring up somebody who is very special in my life. Have you guys heard of a show called Cowboy Bebop? Yeah? yeah? <laughs> Well, this person actually taught me how to act in the process of recording Cowboy Bebop. I had been doing anime for a little while, but I really wasn't in touch with my own emotions and vulnerability and all that stuff that real actors are supposed to have until that show. Uh, she also played Julia in that show. And uh, we've been friends for about 17 years, and about two years ago we got together as a couple. And so talk about life imitating art. This is the love of my life right here. Mary Elizabeth McGlynn. Come on up, baby. All right. <laughs> She's also the singer for Silent Hill. You guys know Silent Hill? She is the singer of the Silent Hill Band. And uh, she directed me on Naruto and Digimon. She's directing Tangled now for Disney, yeah. the new series, and a million bazillion other things. So, hey, baby. Hi, baby. Do you want to answer some questions up here sure, with me? Sure. I'll talk quietly because this is a loud mic. There's <laughs> a guy in a red shirt. Uh, just wanted to say hi and bye real quick. <laughs> red shirts yeah. don't last very long, we understand, as we understand. Yeah. <laughs> um, I know. It's a Star Trek world. Come on. We know that. <laughs> so, we're just going to open this up to you guys, I think, and ask, answer your burning question. Hold them a little higher. I have to choke up on the mic, apparently. Okay. Okay. Snay on the oak chain. <laughs> okay, fire away. First of all, how you doing? Very well, thank you. Good morning. So I gotta say, throughout all the animes I've seen, one of my most favorite, most memorable, definitely top three, would be Great Teacher Onizuka. In fact, I have oh, a tattoo nice. of Onizuka, so very meaningful character to me. Uh, can you just, one of my favorite things he's ever done in the series would be answering the phone and his, his line. I'd love to hear it. Oh, I don't remember what the line was. You have to remember it. Do you know the line? I don't remember the exact words, but it'd be like a Kichi Onizuka, 20, that's like still single. And then he like uh, would always state that he's single. Kichi Onizuka, still single. You staying in school? How old are you? <laughs> you wanna come home? <laughs> he was filthy. For that, that was the weirdest show, and the reason I don't remember anything about that show is that when I walked into that room, they had the original Japanese translation, which never fits to the, the English words. And usually we have what they call an ADR script, where somebody actually spends 30 or 40 hours writing out every syllable and making sure that we have a, a true script that works with the visuals. Mm -hmm. I walked into that room with none of that. I actually had to improvise the entire show, all of the episodes. So I have no idea how it even came out, and I've never seen it, so... It was one of your first ever, right? Was it before Bebop or after? I don't remember. I don't remember yesterday, dude. I don't know. <laughs> um, it, was, it was fairly early on. I think I had done Bebop before that, or at least I was working on Bebop around the same time. But, um, yeah, that was an improv show for me, so I, I don't remember anything about that, <laughs> except that he was sort of filthy, and, but in the end, he was a good teacher, yeah, right? He, he was a good teacher, but he, was a, he stayed a virgin throughout the whole series. And, yeah. yeah. Like me. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm, a, I'm a born again virgin. Yes. Yes. She, no. Yeah. Okay. Well, thank you for that. Thank you very much. <laughs> Brought back happy and painful memories all at the same time. <laughs> but as long as it's a happy ending, that's all that matters. What? Hi. Hey. Uh, Dirty. Dirty see, minds. See why I love Dirty her? Dirty minds. Okay, fire away. Uh, so you did uh, Amon in uh, Legend of Korra, and uh, that was really awesome. Thank you. You've been purified. 
So, um, yeah, and then a few years later, they had you come back and like do like three lines uh, for in, like uh, season three. Yes. Like, how did that work? Did they actually call you back? Did you like do it over the internet? How did that work? Well, I said, hello, I'm on the phone. Can you hire me? Uh, they just hired me to come back and do it, and they wrote some silliness. It, it was one of the few things I didn't have to audition for, fortunately, because they knew that I could do it. Uh, it was just a big surprise. I thought I was long gone from the series by that time, so it was just a happy surprise to come back and do something, especially something that silly mm -hmm. as that character. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was really, really sad at the end of the series. I'm not, at the end of that season, I'm not gonna tell anybody what happened. No spoilers here, even though it was, what, three years ago or something? Yeah. Um, but yeah, that was very traumatic for me, more than most shows when something happens to a character, so. Yeah, it was all right in the feels when we saw it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Thank you for the question. Thank you. Hi. Hi. Um, when you first started voice acting, like, and you saw yourself on like the TV shows and video games, was it kind of like weird to hear like your own voice from <laughs> coming out of like something else? Yes. Uh, <laughs> yeah, it was really weird. I grew up hating my own voice. When I was a little kid, I hated my own voice, and I, I was super insecure about a lot of things, but that was one of the things, when I first heard it recorded and played back, I just thought it sounded weird and tinny, and I don't know, I, I just wasn't very it's happy with it. It's just bad recording equipment. That's Probably, all. I guess so, yeah. But couldn't handle the depth of you. That's what it was, it just couldn't handle all the awesome that I was trying to put in there. That's what it, <laughs> no, but, I, the, uh, but eventually I started using it as a tool, and one of my brother's friends, uh, who was, was also very insecure as a young boy, um, told me that if you had a deeper voice, you could actually use that to your advantage to keep from getting beaten up and to actually use against bullies and stuff. I was bullied a lot when I was a kid. And so when I was about 12 or 13 years old, uh, I was on crutches. I had dislocating kneecaps and stuff. And uh, bullies would kick the crutches out from under me and do stuff like that. So uh, I would stand down at the end of the hallway when uh, I would go to the bathroom, like, you know, get a, my little pass or whatever to go to the bathroom. And some of the bullies would always happen to be out on the hallway when they weren't supposed to be. So I would stand down at the end of the hallway where they couldn't see me. And I'd say, young man, get back to your class right now. And, and they'd be looking around and I'm just, I'm just peeing, I don't, I don't know. Um, so I started using it to my advantage. And um, so taking that from something that really bothered me at first to something that I could actually use, and then later on seeing it and hearing it back on TV, I, I got used to it after a while. But the first two or three years of listening to myself back on, especially the anime that I was doing at the time, was really painful for me. I thought I sucked. I just thought I sucked. Except for the creature stuff. That was the only thing I felt comfortable doing. The nonverbal <laughs> kind of stuff. That's, that's the stuff I felt comfortable in. So, How, how did you feel about that? Were you, was it weird for you to hear your voice? Yeah, it was very weird. I thought I, had a, I sounded like a man. <laughs> I, just thought, I was like, who's that man talking to myself there? So yeah, it was very strange. And then I started exploring the different ranges, or the, the range, uh, my own range, and it, it changed. But yeah. yeah. For the record, you're the hottest man I've ever been with. Hey, so. hey, I am <laughs> All right, thanks a lot. First of all, I just want to welcome you to Hell Hall, we call Florida. <laughs> yeah, it's sticky here, y'all. It's hot and sticky. What is that about? Yeah. It's sticky. It's beautiful, though, and we've eaten all of your food, so sorry, oh. there won't be anything left by the time we leave. No. Yeah. Well, and I just want to ask, what was it like being the face of Tanami, being Tom and everything? Ah, uh, well, it's still going, man, and, and it never gets old. We've been doing that for a long time now. Uh, Tsunami has changed my life in so many different ways. I've made friends for life over at Adult Swim. Um, and, uh, in fact, I'm going tomorrow, I'm going to Anime Expo in Los Angeles, and we're doing a Tsunami panel. And there's... No, we're not? No, we're not doing that tomorrow. Oh, it's, I'm sorry, it's San, San Diego Comic-Con. Sorry, it's all blending in together. San Diego Comic-Con, I'm going to be going uh, to do a Toonami panel. And so even after all these years, there's enough interest in it to, uh, su uh, to support that. And all of that is due to the fact that you guys tune in. And when Toonami went off the air, the reason that it came back is because you guys got online and supported it. So I, I'm so grateful to all of you. Was anybody here involved in the Twitter storms when we were trying to get Tsunami back in the air? Yeah. Awesome. Well, thank you for Woo! that. And for those of you who don't know, when Tsunami went off the air, the network just couldn't support it anymore. We couldn't get the programming we needed. And uh, every Saturday, I think it was every Saturday, we got online and, and 
tens of thousands of us just started bombarding Twitter and the network, asking them to bring it back. And so it was one of those examples of how powerful the fan base really can be. So And early on in social media, it was, you know, Twitter wasn't what it is now then. That's true. So they was really inundated. Yeah. And, and you guys wrote into the network on their website. We shut down the website. And uh, so there's a lot of love for Toonami. And I'm just thrilled that we can bring another generation some new anime and just keep it all alive. So thank you guys. Give yourselves a hand for keeping that alive. So <laughs> Only Toonami on Adult Swim. Kids love it. Hi, uh, I'm a big fan. I think uh, Boys Don't Run the most underrated game of all time. And uh, I want to ask, what is a video game franchise you want to work with but you never got to? Wait, say that one more time. What is a video game franchise you want to work with but you can never... But, I mean, <coughs> sorry. What is a franchise in a video game that you want to work with but you, you would like to work for? Oh, which video game I'd like to work on? Yeah. Um, probably Kingdom Hearts. I think that would be really fun because I feel like a lot of my characters would fit into that universe really well. And for some reason, they never used any of my characters in it. So that's probably the one that I would love to be a part of, just right off the top of my head. I've gotten to work on so many, dude. I can't, I, you know, I'm so grateful for the ones that have worked out. But um, yeah, that probably Kingdom Hearts more than anything else. Yeah, for those of you who don't know, Steve holds the Guinness World Record for number of roles played by an actor in video games. <laughs> Yeah, thank you. Yes, it's all about the quantity, not the quality, though. So. <laughs> <laughs> thank you for that. It's just the same guy in every game. <laughs> Good afternoon. I keep Hi, how are you? Uh, this is going to be a bit of an odd question. Uh, I was at Mary's panel the other day, and Steve, you shared an interesting story <laughs> about, I guess, a, a recording session where you had to do like this weird grunt, and you got a bit of an interesting assistance yes. with that. And uh, I was wondering if you two ever actually figured out if hawking a loogie is the actual reaction to that. <laughs> well, for me it is. Uh, for those of you who weren't there, I was in the middle of a scream during a session. There were a number of, his, uh, of us in a very small booth that really w wasn't built to accommodate that many people. And in the mid-scream, I got a finger up the... <laughs> And I went, <laughs> Literally, it was yeah. you know, over the pants. Well, it was close enough. I think she got in two or three knuckles. I'm not oh. sure. It was, um, <laughs> but yes, for me, that is the reaction. So, hi, kids. Hey, <laughs> how are you? That's Ariel That's right there. That's Ariel and his son, who we and, haven't met yet, and he's amazing. And Aaron, right? You must be yes. Aaron. Yes. Everybody give it up for Everybody Ariel and Aaron. Everybody say hi to Ariel yes. and Aaron. They're friends over at the Royal Palm in the restaurant. So go over there and eat their food. He's, he's the best there is at what, he's the best there is at what he does. <laughs> yes. <laughs> uh, so thank you for that. And thank yes, I, I, that doesn't happen often, but when it does, I would imagine that's what will happen. I don't often get a finger up the butt, but when I do. You know, we'll do some experimenting and let you know. <laughs> what? You guys, <laughs> filthy. <laughs> Kids love it. Okay, fire away. Uh, hey, Steve. Hi. Been a big fan of yours since uh, the early 2000s. You got Orochimaru, Gilman, Spike. Like, it's all just awesome. Probably Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Wait, I My directed question. all of those. Do that again. <laughs> well, I'm a big fan of yours, too, then. <laughs> so, my question to you is, what was your initial reaction when you found out uh, Toonami was finally coming back on and you get to be Tom again? Like, what was your initial thoughts, feelings? Eight-year-old fangirl squee. <laughs> uh, well, I couldn't believe it. You know, I, I really wanted to believe that we had enough power as a community to, to make that happen, but it's a network that we're dealing with, and there's money involved in lawyers and contracts, and I wasn't sure if that would really happen. And when I got that call, I, I think all of us, including everybody at the network, squeed, a bunch of grown people squeeing like little children. We were all really excited, and we started doing it for nothing in the beginning. Some of the people there at uh, Adult Swim still stay after hours on their own time on weekends to put the show together for you guys just because they love anime so much, and they really care about you guys. And uh, so it really has been a labor of love all along, and uh, it, it, uh, from the heart, it, it really filled me up that the network listened and were willing to give us another shot at it. Awesome, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good question. Hello. Hello. Oh, how, how did it feel to see that you guys did such a good job on the big O, Roger Smith's one of my favorite characters, that you guys actually got another season back here 
for the West since it didn't do as good back in the East where it originally came from. Yeah, oh. that was you were on Bigo too, right? No, no, I was Bigo? doing Bebop. Oh, you're doing. Oh, okay. Okay. Oh, I thought you were. I just figured you're on everything with me. Um, <laughs> Well. Big O was such a weird thing, and I'm on the other side of it. I'm just a voice monkey, so I don't know anything about the politics. You guys actually knew more about it than I did at the time. All I knew was that the show was continuing. I didn't realize that they were actually doing it for the states. Uh, it was kind of an anomaly in our industry. That just doesn't happen. So I was, I was just happy to have another gig at the time. I was broke at the time. I was happy to have another gig. I didn't understand anything that was going on in the show. But I love the look of it and the feel of it and had that sort of Batman feel to it. And it yeah. was right place, right time. So I'm, I was really glad it came back. All right. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you. And I still don't understand it for the record. <laughs> Tomatoes, I don't know. Hi. Hello. Um, how are you today? Very well. How are you? <laughs> That's good. I'm good, thank you. Um, so I just wanted to ask, Durarara? I never can pronounce that right. But Dura, we all say da 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 So I think the original aired in 2006 or something, uh, a while ago. Um, but when the new series came out, did you have any trouble like readjusting back into Dota Chain's role, or did it just fit back like it was now, yesterday? They they play what we call reference. Uh, material for us. They keep all the original stuff and they will play me a line. It's, if they play me one line of a character, I can usually snap right back into it. It doesn't take me long at all. And especially a character that's as well defined as uh, Kyohei. So, yeah, it wasn't that hard at all. And, and I usually do sort of a, a trigger line for each character in my mind. And for that one, it's, don't call me Dotachin. <laughs> and so as long as I had that in my head, it was easy for me to get right back into it. Yeah, not a problem at all. Yeah, awesome. key lines for characters are sort of are is it's the best way to get back into it. If you know, if you're doing a, uh, an accent or or anything, if they just play that one, you know, I had to do who was it, Rosa the Crimson, and it was uh, this Russian character, and I would always think of Helen Mirren saying Doctor Floyd in 2010, and I would instantly get back. I'd be like Doctor Floyd. Oh, okay, I'm back in on the accent. So it's great to have that sort of catchphrase to get you back in. Yeah, and the better the director, the easier it is too, because if we lose that uh, for some reason, the director can help us by giving us some context for the character. And she, she's aware of the entire arc of the story. She might be able to give me a little bit of context to, to trigger something in my memory. So I rely on my director very heavily for that kind of thing too. Yeah, any stupid thing, I'm Diane Sawyer. Good, let's go. You know, and you're right back into whatever the That doesn't work is. very well for Kyohei, but it... No, but, it doesn't. It, but, it, <laughs> <laughs> but it might now. If we get another season, it might. Yeah. I'm going to use that. I am Diane Sawyer. I'm Don't Diane call me Dota Chi. Dota Chi. Well, I hope you guys do get another season for that, because it was amazing, and you did really well as your character. Awesome. So, thank, thank you, you so much. That. It was really fun. Thank you. Thank you. Carabast. I was going to ask that. Hi. Um, a uh, question: um, Who won the fight, Mugen or Spike, but with no weapons? Spike. <laughs> <laughs> no space weapons. Uh, Spike. <laughs> yeah. Wow, that'd be a tough one. Yeah, probably Spike. <laughs> I think Spike. Just. Oh come on! You saw him fight just in in the in the first episode. That that amazing fight that he had with the with that had, sweet Clint Eastwood outfit. Amazing, yeah. right? Yeah. That was beautiful. Yeah, he knows how to flow like water, baby. You can't, he does. Hurt, can't hurt water. That roundhouse kick? Come on. <laughs> I think he has bigger feet, too. So. <laughs> yeah. Thanks. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Why does everybody have to fight? Why can't we all get, it, get along? I know. Hi. Who would sing hi. better? That's the next question. <laughs> Who would be a better singer? I don't know. Okay. Hi. 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 So I love you both. I'm um, just going to throw that out there. Anyway, Cowboy Bebop's one of my favorite animes of all time. I'm just wondering, you have a favorite episode of it? Well, we've been... What's great is the whole cast, we're all getting together tomorrow in Los Angeles. There's a big Cowboy Bebop kind of reunion tomorrow um, for Anime Expo. And what we're doing now is we go around and for charity, we'll do a staged reading of Toys in the Attic which is, as a director, it was like I was directing Alien and 2001 mashed together, you know? And it was so much fun because it was the one episode where it was just the five members of the Bebop. 
you know, I'm including Ayn. And it was kind of a magical episode. I love that one. Yeah, for me, it's, it's either that one or um, Mushroom Samba. Oh, yeah. <laughs> it's, uh, it's just so ridiculous. It was great. Yeah. It was really fun. The standalones are fun. Yeah. Well, thank you. Thank you. My pleasure. What was your favorite? Jupiter Jazz, I was going to say. Jupiter Jazz yeah. is pretty good. They're all good. Hi. Hi. So, Cowboy Bebop was actually what got me into anime, because I started with Jupiter Blues, actually. Oh, well, sorry for starting your habit for you. Well, <laughs> and then I found Samurai Champloo and Big O, and I just love them. And if you had to pick between those three, which was your favorite to work on? Oh, God, it's so hard to choose. I, I would say at this point in my life, it would be Cowboy Bebop because well, you Mary. Met your wife, so. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, and it led to so many other things. I mean, I, I, Samurai Champloo became as a result of Bebop, and uh, and so many other things in my career. Megas XLR came from that. Toonami came from that. Even Legend of Korra came so from that. So it's like you're jumping off. Yeah, it's it's it was a big springboard for me. And again, I, that's where I learned how to act too. So, just uh, personally and professionally, that was probably the biggest benchmark in my life. And Thank it's the you. gift that keeps on giving too. <laughs> Thank you. Doll. <laughs> Hi. 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 Uh, I was, uh, I just kind of was thinking about how most of your really famous characters are either anti-heroes or villains, and I was wondering if you had a favorite type of character to play or that you look for a specific type of character to give him. Oh. Well, for a while, you kind of get typecast. I think vocally, it happens in the on-camera world, too. You know, you get typecast. I played a lot of villains for a long time, and it wasn't until Ghost in the Shell came along that I could actually use my voice as a lead female character that kicked ass Which was awesome. in, for good and not <laughs> for bad, you know. So that was great. And now, as you know, as I'm getting older, it's fun to explore like old women and Pepperidge Farm remembers and just <laughs> silly, you know, stupid things and, and, and just completely going off what I normally would do to explore other uh, characters and, and to expand my own wor you know, range as, as an actor. But the villains are always fun. I mean, it's, they're confident, they know what they're doing, they love what they do. <laughs> There's no conflict within them, usually. It's just, you know, Lady Jagra just wanted to kill and drink Johnny Young Bosch's blood, and who doesn't, really, right? when it comes down Duh. to it, you know? Yeah. How about you? Yeah, well, I started out as a bad boy. I started out as a creature, and so that's, that was really my comfort zone, and especially because it was nonverbal, I didn't have to <laughs> enunciate anything. I didn't really have to know how to act necessarily. I just had to be able to, you know, do sick sounding stuff and and good death scenes with lots of gurgle. Um, <laughs> so, gurgle. so I'm good at gurgle. I, yeah, I I get a lot of that work. Um, but I I think my favorite kind of character of all is really sort of the antihero, something like Wolverine, where he's he's very conflicted. That I I feel like the bad guys. Uh, as fun as they are, I, I do get into their mindset. Somebody like Amon, for example, I, I love getting into that mindset, and he really does believe that what he's doing is the right thing. And there is no conflict there. He's, he's very straightforward about it. Somebody like Wolverine, I think, is just confused all, all the time. Spike, also. They, they're not really sure what their purpose is. They're just kind of making the, their, li their way through life the best they can, like most of us do. And they tend to lean a little bit more towards the good side than the bad side, but they could very easily go the opposite direction. And I think that's just true of human nature. So uh, just from a psychological standpoint, I think that's really interesting to do and to walk that line and sort of teeter over on either side from time to time. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, and Hi. welcome to the sticky version of LA. <laughs> sticky LA. If it's Japanese, that's... it's stecky desu, which is good, right? Isn't stecky like cool? Or... I don't, know. I, don't, I don't know either. <laughs> uh, well, thank you for both for what you do. Um, as a director and as a voice actor, when a character like Spike um, shows almost no emotion, how do you show emotion in your voice without sounding monotone or boring? What do you do? What are the things you look for or do to really bring out emotion in a character that doesn't really show much? For me, it's use of breath. Breath is life. And even if you just have a little sigh out before before you deliver a line, it infuses it with something that everybody can relate to because we all breathe and we all sigh and we all laugh and we use breath, whether we're conscious of it or not, every single day. It's the thing that keeps us going. It's like breath and water and that's it. So for me, it's always a use of breath mm -hmm. if, if that's at all possible, even if it's in a really subtle scene. Talk about the scene in the jail that was uh, from the movie. Yeah, well, uh, in the Cowboy Bebop movie, that was 
probably the hardest scene I ever recorded at that point in my career because I had to get go to a vulnerable place. And to access that, it, it took Mary quite a while to pull that out of me because I didn't know how to do that as an actor. And that uh, going to a vulnerable place hurts. I had to conjure up painful memories to get there. And uh, to, to get that nuance, I, I had to allow myself to go there physically first and feel pain, think about the things that made me sad and, and use, like, like Mary was saying, use the breath. And, and so saying something like, uh, you have a line that just says, that was a long time ago. You could just read it from the paper and say, that was a long time ago. Or you could go, that was a long time ago. And, and it, you sort of settle into that, that emotion and let it out in an organic fashion. And it changes the whole flavor of the scene. So, um, or even adding a little word sometimes, you know, will we'll help that. Uh, so you could even use that same line as like, yeah, that was a long time ago. And it will, again, change the flavor of it a little bit. And you can do 10 different takes, and you never know how that take is going to play with what the next actor does. And then the director is the one who creates that alchemy with all those different flavors, and she'll put that together to see how that blends for the final mix. So it's, uh, especially for the nuanced things like that, where you really don't have a lot to go from, that's where the skill of acting comes in and a great director comes in to really make that scene function. Awesome. I, I even noticed in that you used the body language, your own body language, that you wouldn't be able to see, uh, but you can, as you spoke it, you even sat into that, that same place. So Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. For, uh, even for characters like Wolverine, for example, whenever you're hearing uh, the punches, like <clears throat> that kind of thing, I'm literally, I'm standing in front of the microphone, but I am throwing those punches physically, or I'm throwing a kick physically. And at the end of the day, my whole body is racked. I feel like I've been in that fight. I feel like I've got broken ribs, and it takes me a day to heal, because you have to internalize it to get that sound out, and yet stay with your face, what we call a, a welker away from the microphone, uh, that we called it after Frank Welker, one of the greatest voice actors yes. of all time. I told him that you, know, you have to keep a certain presence away from the, the big sensitive microphones, just so you don't blow them out and have the pee pops and the plosives, that sort of thing. Uh, but you have to stay right in front of it, and even your, though your body is you know, flailing, so you look like an idiot in the room, <laughs> but it really, really works. It, it really helps to translate it out there, and I think that that's a problem that a lot of new actors or people that come from on camera have, is that either the new actors are afraid to look weird in front of the microphone, or the on-camera stage actors are so free with their body that their face is over here. And you get that, oh, pee. Yeah, and, you get, and you gotta no, do 10 I'm... takes. You know, it takes a while to get used to doing the flailing in front of the microphone, so. Thank you very much. Thank you. I think that's, I mean, that's the key of voice acting, is that you can't rely on your eyebrow raise, you can't rely on that squint in the eye, you can't rely on, you know, that set jaw. It's, you've gotta put that into the read, and I think that's really the key yep. to it, you yeah. know, to good voice acting. Yeah, and so. throwing up with no chunks is not easy, so. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Great question, thank you. Hi. 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 So I was just wondering, um, what's your favorite show, you know, maybe not necessarily that you've worked on, but just like that you enjoy? Oh man, you want to start with It's that time for Animaniacs. <laughs> we're zany to the max, there's baloney in our slacks. I mean, that's amazing. And what's nice is that I've gotten to now direct Tress, Rob, and uh, Jess Harnell. So when I was working at Beetlejuice's Rockin' Graveyard Review at Universal Studios, right? Thank you, Bride of Frankenstein, rock on. Uh, that during our breaks of five shows a day, sweating in the LA heat, not sticky, but still, it's a dry heat, um, we would watch Animaniacs, and I was just wrapped. I'd never seen anything like it, and it was Animaniacs and Batman came on at sort of the same time. Oh, yeah. So that was the golden age to me, the resurgence, the re renaissance of animation. Those two shows blew me away, and now like I, I direct all three of them, and it's just crazy and sort of mind-blowing, and uh, so I would say those two for me. I used to love all the Bugs Bunny cartoons. I, I, everything Mel Blanc uh, right. was formative for me, and and watching it as an adult and seeing what they got away with back then makes it even more awesome. Yeah. And I think it inspired a lot of us to infuse a lot of that stuff into it. So yeah, all that stuff, Daffy Duck and mm -hmm. and uh, Tweety and all that stuff. That, that that was my jam. Yeah. And I'm a lot older than you are. So <laughs> yeah. yeah. All right. Thank you. Thank you. 
Hello. Hi. Hi. Um, so I'm wondering, you've done just so many voices. Have you ever just like pulled one out casually to mess with people? Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we were talking about this yesterday. We um, sometimes will answer the phone for, uh, uh, what do you call them? Telemarketers. The, telemarketers. <laughs> and, <laughs> and we'll give them a, a ride. Have you ever answered as Wolverine? Like, what do you want? Yeah, I have. I have. Well, it was funny because I answered the phone once where a, a guy was calling. He would call incessantly. It was, uh, it was one of the uh, telephone companies. And I would answer it in a different voice each time. And so the first time, I went, hi. He said, uh, hello, is your mother home? And I said, just a minute, I'll go get her. What do you want? <laughs> <laughs> Um, hi, I'd like to interest you in our whatever it was, and I'd say, back off, bub, click. And they call back, and I do something else. Oh, welcome, what can I do for you? Mm -hmm. and, you know, just, you mess with their heads. It's, it's so much fun. Mm -hmm. and, and Goofy, I've done at Disneyland, walking around behind the, the guy dressed in the Goofy character. And so, <laughs> and because the head is so big, they can't really catch you, so I'm, I'm walking behind the whole time. Hey, how are you? <laughs> and they get... They get really upset, and I know they're super sweaty on the inside anyway, and it must just make it worse because they think some stalker is after them. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah drive throughs are fun, too. We mess with drive throughs Yeah, we've got to be careful, though, because uh, I've done it in toy stores before. Uh, you know, I see a little kid that's holding an action figure of one of my characters, and I'll come up behind him, and I'll say, I pay him on TV. And the little kid will start screaming and crying, and his mom will start hitting me with a purse. And, <laughs> It just looks so weird with those voices coming out of an old man's body, you know? Yeah. I've had to bail him out of jail many times. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> hey, how are you? How's it going? Um, so this is actually a question for you, uh, mm. Julie. So you've worked with a lot of different shows, a lot of different studios, but now you're working with Disney. Is yeah. it a different environment? Do you have more freedom or less freedom than as opposed to if you're working on kind of a smaller budget show or something of that nature? Well, every show really depends on the producer and the creator. Some of the creators are there and they'll let you have a lot of input and a lot of say and they'll, they'll just be like, I don't know how to talk to the actors, tell them, I, I want them to do this. And I'm like, okay, so it's my job to interpret that and then to get a performance out of the actor. Uh, and I'm working on three different shows at Disney and now one at Warner Brothers. So each one, the Warner Brothers show, I get a lot of freedom for whatever reason. I think it's just because I'm loud and I just, you know, take the reins and just charge, you know. Uh, but with Tangled, Chris Sonnenberg is just this genius and it's really fun to sort of see him and we kind of work together and on Pen Zero, Sam Levine is, Sam's just got his own idea of what he wants. And so it really sort of depends on which show, uh, specific, the, the specifics of each show, everyone's different. It's not like anime where they were just like, you know what you're doing, go, you know, have fun, you know? That was always my favorite. We did this, and don't hate me, but we did a, a version of Glitter Force, which is very different from the Japanese version. Saban took it, they recut it, they put it together, and they gave it to me and they said, make it funny. And I said, well, with this cast, I think I could do that. It was um, an amazing cast. So uh, that's when I get the most freedom is when they'll just say, do your thing, which is great. Yeah, and to Disney's credit, actually, they really let a lot of their new shows do their thing. Um, Papa Mouse has been really kind to shows like Star Wars, for example. Disney owns it now. Right. But the people at Lucas have free reign to really make Star Wars what it needs to be. And, and that's a huge credit to, to Disney, who... You know, they've got their own brand, and, and their brand is, is very specific and very important to, to maintain for their audience. And yet, they give us all the freedom that we need to, to give you guys what you expect out of these shows. So, I'm really grateful to them. They're, they've been amazing. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you. Disney. Yeah. Hi, Steve. Hi, how are you? Good. Um, you've voiced a lot of characters that I grew up with that I think are really, really popular. Nice. But I also have a soft spot for Colonel Capricola from Brave Panzer Musashi, which is like this really obscure character <laughs> that maybe had 30 lines throughout the game, but uh -huh. for some reason he always stuck with me. So my question to you is, do you have any really minor characters like that that it's, they're kind of inconsequential or maybe kind of forgettable, but you really have a soft spot for them anyways? Wow, yeah, I love the, the small characters. They're, they're hard to remember just because in the grand scheme of things I do play so many characters, but there have been a few that were considered to be uh, ancillary characters or side characters that, that were very meaningful. One, for example, would be during Digimon, I played a character called JP. 
Um, you guys remember JP from Digimon? <laughs> yeah. Um, he was this boy who was sort of overweight and insecure, and that's exactly who I was as a young boy. So to get to flesh that out in cartoon form was therapeutic for me. It, it uh, was a cathartic kind of character to play and became one of my favorite ones to do. And it was, it was hard vocally because pitching my throat up <laughs> like that is not easy. Because I'm usually way down here. Um, and I was playing other characters that screamed a lot too. So it was, it was uh, hard physically, but uh, very soothing emotionally for me. So thank you for bringing that up. All right, thanks. I love Bring your up Steven all. Universe t-shirt. Oh, thank you. You're <laughs> Hi. Hi, uh, Steve. I just have a real quick question. Usually when voice acting, do you get to work in the room with the other voice actors, or is it just you by yourself having one side of conversation thinking, I might just go crazy today? <laughs> <laughs> well, it's it, both of those things. It depends on the genre. If it's anime, generally we're alone in the booth because it becomes very chaotic when we're doing all the technicality of matching what's on the screen, reading the script, listening to the director, and maintaining that character through the whole thing. So it's a lot more efficient to do it one at a time. Same with uh, video games, especially something like Mass Effect, where my character would come in, I would come in and I would have a script that thick, and we'd have a thousand lines to get through in that day. And if you have a bunch of us in the room who act like kindergartners, it's really hard <laughs> for the director to wrangle us all together to get all that work done. Um, but f uh, I'm lucky that most of the, uh, what they call prelay or original animated shows that I work on, we work with a full cast and we work it like a radio play. And it's, that's when it's the most fun because we can work off of each other's energy. New things happen because of the improv skills that everybody has in the room. And it's, we get that camaraderie of the cast too. And uh, that, that's really the most fun that we get to have. Unfortunately, some of the shows, because of people's schedules, we still have to come in one at a time and do our role. And, and, uh, and on, especially in your shows where there are a lot of celebrities, they, because of schedules, they have to come in whenever they're available. Or you, she just flew across the country to record one of her actors. I did. I flew across uh, to Nashville to record Ashley Judd. So it was uh, pretty amazing. But when you get, you know, there was one moment we had Clancy Brown and Zachary Levi in the studio together. And the performance, for, for actors to work off of each other, it's magic. It's absolute magic. And as a director, I just sit there and just, oh, this is so fantastic. And you really see things coming to life. Yeah, it's, it's but, but when you have 10 or 12 people who have a really great sense of humor in a oh, room man. trying to get stuff going on, it's, it's hilarious and it's fun, but a huge part of the director's job becomes kindergarten teacher. It's hurting cats. It's, it really it's is. It's like, guys, we, you're really funny, great walk and impression, shut up and do your line. Yeah. And pretty much, we've had to be separated before, they'll send a, a couple of us out of the room, it's, it, really, mm -hmm. it gets out of control sometimes. We yeah. just sit and laugh. We can't mm -hmm. help it. But that, that is the most fun of all. I was working on um, Transformers Prime uh, years ago with Frank Welker and Peter Cullen, Optimus and Megatron. And those guys have been friends for like 40 years. And they're also brilliant impressionists and comedians, improv artists. And they would get into a routine. They'd just start doing like this comedy routine from the 30s and they would go for 20 minutes. And it was so brilliant that we would all just kind of sit back in our chairs and watch this show <laughs> unfold in front of us. And they didn't care at that point how much money was being spent and that we were going to go overtime. The directors, producers, everybody just sat back like a bunch of little kids and went, oh, that's so good. I hope you're recording this. Everything. <laughs> yep. It's amazing. Yeah. Yeah. Thank really you. fun. Thank you. Deadpool. It has to be Deadpool. Uh, there's, there's so many Deadpools at this Comic-Con. I know. I know. Um, no, and all of them suck. No, I like Deadpool. I like, <laughs> I like Deadpool. The creator's here. Don't say that. Don't say that. <laughs> Wolverine has a problem with him, though. Yes. Okay. Um, first, I, I got two quick questions. Okay. Um, one question for zombies. Yes. Um, is the Ray Gun Mark III coming? Is what? The I've Ray done. Gun Mark III coming. Uh, I cannot confirm or deny. You, you, you know better than to ask that question, uh, dude. Yeah, no. Um, uh, any questions about stuff that hasn't been officially announced, we're not allowed to say anything. And if we do, the chip in our neck will be activated. My head will explode right in front of you. it's the end so, of Kingsman. Yeah. <laughs> we're rainbow mist. Yeah. Second uh, question. Can you wrap your head around the storyline from uh, Zombies? No. Still working on that. Still working on that. Anybody Black Ops fans here? Call of Duty? Yeah, Zombies? Yeah. 
yeah, it's it's getting weirder and weirder, and that's the way we like it. So yeah, it's it's pretty cool. We're having a great time with that. Okay. Nothing more fun than splattering maggot addicts. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks, man. Hey, hey, there. Hey. Hey, I kind of have a weird question. It's from not. I don't know, not one of your very known games. It's Bulletstorm. Bulletstorm, yes. And Love that. I think that was probably one of the most iconic, vulgar things I've ever seen you do. <laughs> Thank you. I will <laughs> take that as a compliment. What do you think about the creative cursing you've done in that game? The What was that? Creative cursing. The creative cursing. cursing. Oh, yes. Oh, that was the best part of it. Uh, I can't say any of those words now because there are probably kids in the room. <laughs> uh, we got to make up our our own new curse words. That was really fun. And in fact, that was a weird game. If you guys aren't familiar with Bulletstorm, the uh, campaign to drive sales for that, we did this internet campaign, and ba basically it was my character insulting the player to get off their butt on their mom's couch in the basement and go buy the game, go get a job, make some money and buy the game. It was that, it was that level, but with a whole bunch of brand new curse words. Um, so it was super fun to do, and I, uh, I probably offended a lot of people. If I did, I'm sorry, and I'm not sorry. <laughs> and I think you look a lot different in person, because like, I see your IMDB page, and I'm just like, oh, hey, look, he's a chubby guy like me. I was like, oh, he's physically fit. <laughs> oh, no, I'm, I'm chubby under this dude. Look, look, see? It's the shirt. It's, it's very slimming. It's very slimming. Yeah. Gun show, baby. Yeah. Welcome to the gun show. Come on. Thank you. <laughs> I fluctuate, dude. Tomorrow, <laughs> tomorrow I'm going to be 300 pounds. You'll see. Hi, Voice acting, you? acting. Yes. Hi. Hi, how are you? Uh, not too long ago, you, uh, Logic released his latest album, The Incredible True Story, which, by the way, I personally loved it. And in it, it's a story, uh, you know, oh, obviously you already know. You play one of the characters in it. Can you tell us what that whole experience was like, lending your voice into, like, something kind of, I guess you'd say, out of your zone, since you're usually more, more known for, like, TV shows and games and such. But now you lent your voice for an album. And do you see yourself doing more those kinds of things more in the future. Yeah, uh, does everybody know who Logic is in here? He's a hip hop artist. He's one of the, in my opinion, one of the greatest in the world right now. And he's, he's become not only my friend, I call him my little brother. Uh, he, he starts every show with peace, love, and positivity, which you don't hear a lot of hip hop artists doing. Yeah. Uh, but he's, he's a genius. He's really amazing at what he does. And he did this album called The Incredible True Story. And I get this phone call from my agent saying a hip hop artist wants you to do something on his album. And I'm thinking, me? A Jewish 56-year-old white guy? Why? <laughs> and and uh, so I met with him. I was curious. He lived right around the corner from me. I went to his house. I walk into this beautiful place, and I, I walk into his room, and it looks like a 25-year-old is living there. It's got game controllers all over the floor that I'm stepping over trying to get into the room. And he's got Akira projected on the wall, and he's, he's making some beats right there in his office. And before a word came out of his mouth, he just looked over and he smiled and he goes, hey, how you doing? And I, I just fell in love with the guy immediately. I didn't care what we were going to do. I just said yes. The answer was already made right there. I didn't know what we were going to do. And then he proceeds to tell me what this story is that he's creating. And he's a huge anime fan and a huge gamer. Yeah. Cowboy Bebop was one of his favorite shows. It inspired him and got him through some really, really rough times during his childhood. He grew up in like a gangland kind of atmosphere. And he turned that into this amazing positive musical experience for people and has just been rounding masses all over the world. He's on tour right now. And so he decided to do this thematic album, which is my favorite kind of album. I grew up uh, during the 70s. I was a teenager and everybody was doing the themed album back then. And, yeah. and you really haven't seen too many good ones since then. So he decided to weave this whole anime story through there. And he created this uh, character in space for me called Thomas. Uh, and we were discovering a new habitable planet for the citizens of Earth. There were only, I think, five million left uh, because we've basically destroyed everything, gotten rid of all our resources. And I thought, this is the perfect thing for me. But he wanted me to do some on-camera video stuff. I'm super uncomfortable doing that. But because he asked me, I said yes. He dressed me in this jumpsuit. We go to the set, and this is the coolest part of the whole process of this, is that his manager rents out this big uh, soundstage for us to record the music video. And I look at the address, and it looks really familiar. And I realized that's where we recorded this particular soundstage. They also have audio stages there. We recorded Akira there. We recorded uh, Big O. We recorded Ghost, Ghost in the in Shell. The shell. Um, uh, uh, 
Trigun, some of these amazing, amazing anime shows, all of his favorite shows we recorded right there in the same building. And the same people that ran that place were still in charge of this place. So as we're there, they happen to have the sound stage where they shoot movies and stuff, and they had the sound stage with all these really cool spaceships and things. And it had been there since we were recording back in the old oh, days. Yeah. And so we're on the sound stage setting lights and everything. And I said, Bobby, you've got to come over here. Do you realize where you are? And he goes, what? No. I said, you didn't do this on purpose. And he goes, no, what are you talking about? I said, come here. And I grabbed his hand and I take him to the back room and I'm showing him posters of Akira and Cowboy Bebop and all these different shows that all of these people were involved in. And I'm taking him from studio to studio to show him where these things are recorded, what mics we used. And he started freaking out like a little fanboy. It was... Yeah. It was so the cool. most amazing full circle. So that album, that album was so full circle in so many different ways. And it, it really bonded us. And then last year we went to New York Comic Con and, and Bobby did his first panel at a convention. And it was half anime fans and half hip hop, hip hop fans. Yeah. And it was so funny. It was like putting chocolate and peanut butter together. People that would never talk about their love for the other thing. So they were like these hardcore hip hop guys who were secretly anime fans and they got... Oh, you liked it too, man? Are you a brony? And, and, <laughs> and, and, and then on the, on the other side, you know, you have the anime fans who's like, yeah, yeah man, I, I love hip hop, but I can't tell any of my friends because they'll kill me at D&D. &D. And, and so it was, it was great. He's bringing, he's merging these communities together and letting people know that it's okay to love whatever you want to love. And, right. and for a 26 year old to have that kind of insight on the human condition, let alone being a musical genius. I mean, he's, he's just such a gift to all of us right now. So if you haven't heard Logic, check him out. Please, please do that. He's on tour right now. He's doing the Endless Summer Tour with g yeah. And uh, his, his most recent album is called The Incredible True Story. But he's, yeah. he's got a couple other ones. And the latter part was, do you see yourself lending your voice like more albums in the future, like other types of albums and stuff like that? Uh, as long as I don't have to rap, I'm all over it, man. <laughs> <laughs> Thank I leave so that much. to the professionals. Yeah, I would love to do more of that. It'd be really cool. I'd love to play a little on it, too. It'd be fun. Yeah, I was so caught off guard when I saw you on the album cover. I'm just like, that's Steve Bloom. I know. God. I know. It freaks me out, too. All right. Thank you Especially, so much. Thank you. Uh, he was, Logic was on Jimmy Kimmel, and he brought out, uh, Jimmy brought out the album and put it right towards, right up to the camera lens, and Steve and I were in the living room going, uh, you're on Jimmy Kimmel, honey. <laughs> <laughs> it was so weird. Awesome. And Jimmy yeah. Fallon, too. It was yeah, yeah. wild. Yeah. Man, that was crazy. Love Logic. Love you, baby. Yay. Hey, how you doing? Great. Um, I just wanted to say my two favorite characters that you've done have to be Orochimaru and Tank Dempsey. So I wanted to see if maybe you can give off Orochimaru's laugh and maybe a quote from Tank Dempsey. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> Jam <sighs> uh, You got dead flesh on my new boots! Hoorah! Wow, amazing. Not quite as musical for Tank, but All right, thank, thank you. Thank you so much, thank you. I love you. Thank you, love you too. <laughs> love Can you, I love use your too. body for experimentation? Hi. Hi. Um, how do you describe playing Amon in Legend of Korra? Very freeing, all things being equal. Um, <laughs> revolutionary. Uh, what other words could I use to describe it? Was, it was amazing. Um, one of the most understated villains I've ever gotten to play, which in my opinion made him much more creepy. When I get a villain like that at first, I, because he was so broad and, and spectacular when he comes out on the stage, uh, my first impression was to really make him stentorian and, and a deeper voice. But they had uh, the director, Andrea Romano, and all her wisdom had me pull it all back into this and just speak very quietly and very concise. And to me, that made it so much more creepy and real. So it was, it was a really fun experience crafting that character. And one other question. Do you think it being on Nickelodeon limited the show to you? Not, not for me, no. I don't think so. I mean, they, I suppose they could have gotten more violent. <laughs> but uh, I think that they they were able to achieve what they wanted to achieve. And, and really the beauty of that show is the attention to the details and uh, the storytelling, the fluidity of the movement. I mean, they, they actually choreographed all of the fight scenes with real Sifu, real Kung Fu masters. Uh, they would choreograph that and shoot that first and then animate it. And that kind of attention to detail you don't see often in uh, cartoons. So I think that they were able to achieve everything they set out to do, at least in the first few seasons. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Yeah. 
think we're okay on time for a few more minutes, yeah? Hi. Hi, how are you? Uh, really nervous, actually, so I, I just wrote down what I was going to say. because Awesome. I have cheat sheets, too, dude, just in case. <laughs> <laughs> um, so what I wanted to say, I didn't really have a question or anything. It's just a statement, but um, you did a monologue back in the early run of Toonami um, about dreams and inspiration, I believe. Uh, you know, featured a bunch of cut shots from animes, different quotes and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that was really touching, uh, I would say, to me as a kid growing up. Uh, you know, we are a mixed bag of people here that, you know, you've touched across generations, you know, and so you've inspired lots of different people. But, you know, I like to go back from time to time. I I'm 25 years old now, you know, and I go back to that monologue when I want to feel like a kid again and, you know, just feel inspired. Uh, so I wanted to say, you know, one, thank you for being here and, you know, sharing with us and allowing us to come at you with all these questions and whatnot. But, you know, also personally, just thank you for inspiring me and so many others, you know, to do and dream and just for so much. Thank you. Thank you for that. Wow. Thank you. Do you have that speech with you? I, I, I don't have it written down or anything, I, but I look at it on YouTube like so much. It's just, it's one of my favorites, you know? Well, f for the record, those, those speeches are the things that were most meaningful to me uh, for all of the things that we've done in Toonami. And the guys there at Adult Swim agree with that. I, I have Fall Down Seven Times with me. Do you like that one? Yes. Do you want me to do that one live? Sure, yeah. yeah. You Do you could. guys know this speech? Okay, let me see. That's what this the cheat so sheets are good. for. That's what the cheat sheets I wish I had the one that you're talking about because I don't remember that one. That must have been pretty early on. It was. It was. Okay, this is the one that's most requested in recent years. I've got to open it up now. Let's see if I can find it. Uh, okay. That's, that's the nice thing about being voice actors. You don't have to remember anything. So. <laughs> All right, so here's the deal life doesn't always want to be your friend. Sometimes it'll feel like life wants to hurt you. But you can't just hide, because nobody likes a quitter. You gotta take chances. They never said it was gonna be fun or easy. And whether it's when you're totally ready or when you least expect it, it doesn't matter. Life will punch you right in the face. Now you can lie there for a second and cry a little if you need to, but get back on your feet, because it's getting back up that counts. That's what shows you've got heart. And that's what helps keep you going. You fall down seven times, get up eight. And know that we'll be right there with you. Only Toonami on Adult Swim. <laughs> Thanks, man. <laughs> yeah, that, that stuff gets me every time. And, and those... Those things are so meaningful to me, too. They, they uh, not only help you guys, but I, I go through stuff, too. We all go through stuff. And that, that's the kind of, those are the kinds of messages that I think we need to hear more of these days rather than all the garbage that we hear on the news. So any chance I have to, to bring those up. Hopefully next time, I'll, maybe I'll look that one up and I'll try to do that at the next convention. And uh, hopefully I'll try to get that up on YouTube. But thanks for bringing that up, man. It's cool. Hi. Hi. Um, so... In the Cowboy Bebop movie, you have uh, one of my favorite lines of all time. Uh, I love a woman that can kick my ass. You know? yep. uh, I love the kind of woman that can kick my ass. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, uh, what are your thoughts on all the like, strong ass-kicking women that you, uh, well, female characters, I guess, that you've uh, worked with over the years? Wow. Oh, there's so many. Well, this is the biggest ass kicker right here. Um, no. No, I mean, I mean that in a good way. I mean that in the best possible way. Uh, one of the things I love most um, in recent shows that I've been working on are when we have powerful female characters. Because I think that girls, especially when they're growing up, really need that kind of a role model. And uh, Mary has played some of those characters. Yeah. characters. It was weird because I went from doing on camera where I was rescued by everyone. I was always the battered woman that Scott Bakula had to rescue or Chuck Norris or Lorenzo Lamas or Xena, warrior princess, you know. I was being hanged on a horse. That's actually how I got into voiceovers. The horse fell on top of me and dislocated my kneecap. Um, and after I got out of Happy the story. on camera world, I started doing voiceover and I started playing characters that were empowered and strong and did kick ass. And all of a sudden, Motoko Kusanagi came along and I was like, what? And then Kuranai Sensei from Naruto. And 
And it changed something in me. I mean, obviously, I, I don't know. I mean, it's like, and then Zara and Critical Role, I mean, which is just taking it to even another level online. So it's just, just like all of a sudden you start to, the, these characters that you play start to influence yourself and it starts to bring out more confidence in you and not necessarily anger, just a sense of standing on my own two feet strongly and confidently in what can be a pretty scary world sometimes. So it's, it's amazing, you know. And I love working on shows that put out the message that girls can be anything they want to be. I think that's a super important message to yeah. put out there because so many girls are suppressed by either family members or peers or whatever and, and they're they're, they're, they're given their role by their environment. And, and that's so, so sad and so, uh, I, I feel like it, it really takes away from what we can achieve as a society when women aren't allowed to grow into their full potential. So, you're Thank welcome. You. <laughs> um, and, and so we celebrate that every day on Star Wars Rebels. That's, that's a really important thing for us. I mean, our, our commander is Hera, who's this strong, powerful woman, and Sabine, and we've got all these in, uh, women who are coming onto the show, some I can't talk about yet. Uh, mm -hmm. but these amazing, powerful women, and I think it's, it's really super important to have them as role models out there, because you guys do pay attention to that. And I hope that some of the misogynistic guys who don't understand that will look at those shows and go, oh wait, I guess women are capable of something. I'm sorry, and start apologizing to all the women in their life, and, and maybe that'll become a thing. I hope it does. Yeah, thank women you. can so do thank anything. You. We've got time, we're gonna sort of speed round the last uh, four questions. I, I'm a big uh, Call of Duty Zombies fan, and I just wanted to know is when you found out that in uh, Origins, you know, you and the whole gang was uh, coming back, did you have any idea that in Black Ops 3 uh, you'd be center stage after not being uh, the focus for a while? I had no idea, dude. I, I never uh, assume anything. I just assume when one project is over that that's the end of it, and then if they hire me again, it's a really happy surprise. Uh, so I, th that way I'm never disappointed. So yeah, it was a super happy surprise that I got to come back and do Pleasant that. Pleasant surprise for all of us, I guess. Yeah, I, I love <laughs> smacking down zombies, man. Nothing's more fun than that. Yeah, they deserve it. <laughs> and they like it. Uh, hi. hi. Uh, my name's Andrew. Um, hi, Andrew. Hey, Andrew. I just want to say, um, on uh, Friday I came by and I said I loved you, and you said I loved you back. It really meant a lot to me. <laughs> and I do. <laughs> um, as um, like an amateur like, voice actor, I kind of wanted to know, like, I know you get this question a lot, and, like, it's, just, it's a thing, but, like, how is it just getting into, like, the voice acting business? Because I, I, too, like doing voices, and I think it's fun and all that stuff. But is it as, like, is it as hard? Is it easy? Is it, or is it, like, what you make of it? Voice acting business is very hard. Yeah. It's extremely hard. We work at it every single day. We, even after hours, we're recording till the late hours of the night. She's studying scripts every night. It's, it's really, really difficult work, and not only difficult to get into, but difficult to maintain because everybody wants to do it. Yeah. Um, but you can voice act in so many different ways without the pressure of it being a business. Mm -hmm. And uh, there's a website called IWantToBeAVoiceActor.com. It's written by Dee Bradley Baker, who's one of the greatest voice actors in the world and one of our dearest friends. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's kind of the overall guide to what the industry is and isn't, and it will help you to navigate through that. If that's something you're seriously interested in, yeah. if you navigate through everything on his website, seriously, you do all the exercises, you follow all the links, do all the research, and you still want to be a voice actor when all that's done, mm -hmm then it might be the right path for you, because he will tell you no poo-poo what it really <laughs> is. Uh, it's not easy at all. It's, yeah. it's one of the hardest careers in the world to get into, and, and even what, once you do, it's harder to maintain and to keep going cause, because of the competition. And like any other thing in entertainment, it can crush your soul if you're yeah. not prepared for it. You have to have thick skin and be able to take rejection. And one of the greatest pieces of advice, uh, my dear friend Jack Angel, uh, once gave me, if you don't know who he is, look him up, he's amazing, he's a legend. He told me that the audition is the gig. And so if, if you hold that, if you hold on to that, you do it because you love it. And if you do get to that point where you are auditioning, you put everything you have into that audition and you walk away from it and don't think about it again, you go on to the next thing, then you'll never be disappointed. You've, you're actually doing your craft and it, it'll, it'll fill you up. Cool, thanks. All right, yeah. thank you. Two more questions, real quick. Okay. Hi again. Uh, I'm so mad because I totally forgot to ask this earlier, but I'm a mad Mass Effect fan, like N7. Could you please <laughs> Shepard for me? Thanks, Shepard. <laughs> <laughs> that was it? <laughs> oh, great. <Yeah. laughs> I am Krogan. What's it like working with Matt Mercer? And can we get you on there? 
Oh, okay. So we, he's asking about Critical Role, which is, if you guys haven't seen, it's uh, Thursday nights on uh, Twitch Geek and Sundry channel. It's a bunch of nerdy-ass voice actors live streaming D&D. And it's Matt Mercer is this genius dungeon master. I mean, he's one of the greatest storytellers. If you love good stories, if you're sick of bad storytelling, watch this. And just you can just have it on in the background and you can just listen. Because it's Travis Willingham, Laura Bailey, Liam O'Brien, Sam Regal, Marisha Ray, Talison Jaffe, uh, I don't think, I, and Matt, yeah. and, and Ashley Johnson as Pike, who's now on Blind Spot. And she had to go back Vin to New Diesel. York. Pardon me? And occasionally Vin occasionally Diesel. Occasionally Vin Diesel. Uh, Will Wheaton, Will Friedle, Felicia Day, and myself. Um, there have been a couple others. Anyway, uh, Matt is a genius, and uh, I've been directing Matt for years, and then all of a sudden, I get into a position where he's in control, and he's directing the action, and it's amazing, and I realize I am in the presence of someone that is a genius. He really is a genius. And I was thrown in at a level 11, and I'd never played D&D before as a tiefling warlock, and I didn't know what I was doing, and I studied and studied and studied and studied and studied, and because I knew how important it is. It's, 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 a, it's an amazing world, and I was terrified. What if I kill everybody? What if I cause the death of Scanlan? You know, I mean, I would never be able to live that down. So um, it was fantastic, and I'm still trying to figure out how to decorate Percy's crypt. I'm forging dragon arrows as we speak, Madly in love with Vex, you know, things like that, yeah. And in terms of getting you on the show... Yeah, well, Matt, I've known Matt for years now. He's a, a brilliant voice actor, and he's a dear friend. And I'm, I've, he hasn't formally asked me to be on the show, but a, a lot of you guys have asked me if I would be on Critical Role, and I, I, my greatest fear is that I would accidentally kill everybody in the party. And I can't do that to my... They're my just, friends. Just play a fighter and say you hit it. Yeah. <laughs> well, so we're going to start our own campaign, okay. and uh, we're going to start our br fresh new characters, everything, and then get everybody like starting like you are level one war, you know, sorcerer. You get yeah. two cantrips and a spell. You know, it's just like yeah. that's what I want to do. I pick this thing up and I hit that thing with it. Yes. That I can do right now. That's it. But yeah. yeah, pretty much I can handle that. But I, I would like to develop a character that's a oh, little more sure, creative and fun and, and uh, under the guidance of Matt. And so he's going to help us out. We're going to do a, our own little home game. We may periscope from it or something just yeah. so you guys can see what we're doing and see how awful I am at it. Um, what was that? No, no, we won't. We won't split never the split the party. No, no, no. Never split the party. No. Nope. No, so, so we'll, I'll, we'll probably get into that. But, I, but having Matt at the helm of that is, is what we really need. So, yeah, he's great. If you don't know who Matt Mercer is, look him up. Genius. Absolute genius. Great thank you so much, guys. Thank, thank you. you. And thank you guys so much thank for coming you. out. We're going to be signing today until 4.30 or so. So please come by to our booths. We're right next to each other. And yeah. come and say hi and talk about stuff if you have any more questions that we didn't cover and today. And please stay, say thank you to a staff member because they're the reason we're all having a great yeah. time. Love thank you guys. You so thank you so much. Take care.